Now for the really fun part, tilted axes. This is the bit that everybody loves, everybody. And by love, I actually mostly mean hate, but you'll get over it because actually, here's the thing, tilting your axes for a problem like this is the best thing you can do. Remember in that procedure that we wrote down, we had, uh, Oh, it's still there. Uh, we had draw a force diagram, and then, and then this step two we kind of didn't worry about for those other questions because X and Y worked just fine as is. But if something is on an inclined plane, and therefore it's kind of moving in two directions at once, if you're using standard X and Y directions, right? I mean, it's moving this way, it's also moving down. Um, that becomes much more challenging to work out if you use standard axes. And so instead we say, well, no, it's not moving in two directions. It's moving in one direction, it's that way. And so now that becomes our X axis and perpendicular to that becomes our Y axis. Now, another way that you can understand why this makes the problem easier is by considering these two scenarios, those two sets of vectors, um, excluding things like uh, you know bad art right here. These are supposed to be the same three vectors. The difference is for this one I used standard axes, so two of the vectors are off axis, right? So we'd have to like find components for two out of three vectors. For this one, because we tilted our axes two out of three vectors are on the axis, or on one axis or the other. And so that means that we get to just plug them straight into our equations without any need to find the components. Now, if you want to see how awful the algebra is not tilting your axes, I can show you sometime, but I won't do that in this video because I, I don't want to show you the wrong way to do it, okay? Um, instead, we're going to do it the right way with tilted axes. All right, so, this is basically the force diagram for this question. Um, this is example seven in your notes packet. You can find that. Um, the question does start off by saying that we've got a block accelerating from rest down an inclined plane, and we're supposed to act as though it's frictionless to start with. I'm going to go ahead and include friction in our force diagram, but, um, but yes, it'll be initially frictionless. All right, normal force perpendicular to the surface. Gravity, straight down, that's straight down. I'll try that again. And then friction, parallel to the surface, but, uh, you know, pointing up, because after all, friction tries to oppose motion. All right, so we've got gravity straight down, normal force like that, okay. The best sort of axes to use here would be ones that are parallel to motion or attempted motion the other axis being perpendicular to that. All right, so for my x equation, with my tilted axes, um, if there's friction in it, you know, it would have minus friction. And what we would have also is a component of gravity. It may sound kind of weird to talk about the components of gravity, because after all, gravity is always straight down. But remember, we tilted our axes here so that we didn't have to do components for these two things, because actually it's awful if we try to work it out with components of those two things. So instead, we end up with components of gravity. All right, now, the way that the components of gravity are gonna work is always gonna be like this. Exactly backwards from what you're used to for every other question that involves components. You're like, what's he talking about? Okay x direction is usually cosine, and the y direction is usually sine. Inclined planes completely flip your expectations. It's always actually going to be that the x direction is sine, and the y direction is cosine. So if this hypotenuse here is the gravitational force, the whole complete gravitational force. Um, this side is mg sine theta, and this one is mg cosine theta. And the reason it's like that is because, without doing an exhaustive geometric proof here, all right, 
if this is the skinny angle on this triangle, then this is the skinny angle on the vector that represents the gravitational force. So the skinny angle is the skinny angle, is all we're really saying there. All right, so given that this is this angle, the x component is the opposite side of that triangle. So that means it's got to be related to the sine function. And the y component is related to the cosine function because it's the adjacent side to that angle. So that means that in my equation for the sum of the forces along the x-axis, I would have not mg cosine theta like we might expect because I said x. Of course it's cosine. Nope, not for inclined planes. It's mg sine theta. All right, so that's the component of gravity that is pulling the thing down the incline. All right, now, if you are not satisfied with this picture right here, feel free to stop and ponder that for a while, all right? Um, if you want a more exhaustive proof, I can offer you one in class, okay? But here's just sort of an empirical proof. Imagine that the angle is zero degrees. That's a flat surface. Well, the component of gravity along a flat horizontal surface is nothing, zero. And sine of zero is zero. So that would give us the correct result. Okay? And absent friction, that would mean that we would have an acceleration of zero. If the angle is zero, it makes sense that the object shouldn't be accelerated sideways by gravity. On the other hand, if we went with our expectation that x was going to be cosine, then we'd have mg cosine equals ma. And then when we have 0 degrees, we would have uh, an acceleration of g, which means we'd have the maximum acceleration on a flat surface. If that strikes you as a little bit off, you're right. So just empirically, sine works and cosine does not. Okay. For that matter, if you plug in sine of 90, like a vertical drop, not an incline at all, sine of 90 is 1, and so that would mean um, the m's would cancel and would have the accelerations just g on a vertical surface. Okay, so it works. All right, the um, question here now for part b says, all right, if these are the things, if the angle is 30 degrees, the mass is 2 kilograms, what's the acceleration of the block. It said friction was zero in this first part of the question. So I've got mg sine theta equals ma. Bm will cancel out. And that means that the acceleration is g times sine of 30, which in our calculators will come out to 4.9 meters per second squared. So part c now asks, did the mass affect the acceleration? Nope, which is why I want you doing problems symbolically, is because if you're plugging in the mass, you're wasting your time. The mass will actually cancel out almost a distressing frequency. It's going to go away not all the time, but almost all of the time. As long as you have an object being accelerated down an incline due to its own weight, mass is going to cancel out every single time. When mass won't cancel out is when you have two objects. So if there's two objects involved, mass won't cancel out. Uh, but if there's only one object sliding down an incline or falling or whatever under the influence of its own weight, then you're going to have mass canceling out. Okay. Now, um, part D wants to know, what if there's friction? So we put it on there. It doesn't slide down. But if we tilt it at all up more, then it does begin to slide down. Okay, this is going to be another one of those situations where we're talking about finding the maximum angle that you can put it at before it begins to slide down. And so that means that the sum of the forces along our x-axis would be zero. All right. So there's our x component of gravity minus friction equals ma. All right, now, for the 
friction. Remember, go back to the previous question. We said friction is fun, so we're going to put in mu times n in there. So we've got this so far. Well, now we're going to have to find the normal force. And the normal force, then, um, like with every other question, we're going to find using the other axis. So we're going to have some of the forces along the y-axis is going to be normal force minus the y-component of gravity, which is mg cosine theta. And uh, it's in equilibrium along that axis because it's not crunching into the surface or jumping off of it. So that means that the normal force is mg cosine theta. All right. Oh, I made one goof here. Maybe you noticed it already. It's saying it's in equilibrium. It's sitting on the surface, trying to slide down, but failing. So, zero. All right. Now we can plug this in up here for the normal force. So, this equation, subbing in, is going to give us mg sine theta uh, minus mg cosine theta equals zero or mu mg cosine theta equals zero. So I'll move that over. Okay. So now it's going to ask us to determine the coefficient of friction. Again, notice, if you worked this out with numbers, you wasted your time. There's going to be all kinds of stuff that cancels. You should look at this and be like, oh, the m, the m goes away. Oh, oh, so does the g. So the only things we're left with are sine theta and mu cosine theta. So mu is sine divided by cosine. All right. If you're maybe trying to like figure out what the coefficient of friction is, I mean, you could plug in sine 37 co or sine 30 cosine 30, right? That, that wouldn't be that hard. Uh, but you could also do it in one fell swoop in your calculator if you remember the trig identity that sine over cosine is tangent. That equals tan theta. All right, so given that it's a 30 degree angle, if we plug in tangent of 30, we're going to get that the coefficient of friction is 0.577. And remember, that's unitless. No units on the coefficient of friction. Okay, that's everything that you will need for homework two, uh, which you're going to do over the weekend. Obviously, since this is electronic, you can review this as much as you need to. Uh, so if you get stuck on some homework question, go look back at some of these examples and try and figure out what's going on. The dominant things that I didn't cover in the videos that are going to come up in the homework are going to be small differences, like instead of equals ma on the right side, it'll be equals zero. Or the algebra will be different because I ask you to solve for something else. So most of the difficulties that you ought to have, perhaps, uh, are going to be due to differences between the questions and therefore the algebra being different. Okay. Conceptually, though, everything that we've laid out here is going to be covered to one extent or another in the homework. All right, I will see you guys at school uh, over the weekend. So there we are. Until next time.